Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Get Young Plant Roots Big and Strong, presented by Premier Tech. I'm Robin Sitberg with Meister Media Worldwide, publisher of Greenhouse Grower Magazine, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. We'll have time for some questions at the end of the webinar, so if at any time during the presentation you'd like to ask a question, just go ahead and type it in your question pane at the lower left corner of your screen and click Submit. You can do this at any time during the webinar and we'll answer questions at the end. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Troy Beekle, Horticulture Specialist at Premier Tech. Troy has a bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin River Falls and a master's degree from Pennsylvania State University. Both are in horticulture and he specialized in floriculture and plant nutrition. As a part of Premier Tech Grower Services since 1995, he assists customers with questions concerning crop, fertilizer, and water quality issues that relate to Premier, Premier Tech horticultural products. Over the years, Troy has presented numerous grower seminars and webinars, and he's co written or co-written several articles for magazines and for Premier Tech's website and newsletter. You can also find him on YouTube, where he has some clips that help demystify horticultural problems and their solutions. But right now, you can find him here on our webinar, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Troy. Thanks, Robin. I appreciate your, your introduction there, nice words, and also appreciate Meister Publishing for uh, letting us uh, take this time to present. And speaking of that, uh, I'm going to present it to everyone today, and I want to all thank you for coming and uh, for listening on this webinar. I know everybody's busy, so we appreciate that. And so today we want to talk about how to get young plant roots big and strong. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's start off by talking about what we're going to be going into here. So essentially, there's a couple of things I want to talk about. First of all, since we're a growing media company, obviously we're going to mention growing media is one of our big things about growing media selection. Then we'll talk quite a bit on watering, as watering has a big impact on your root architecture and structure. Humidity, temperature, light, and fertilizer all also have some influence on your uh, root development and your crop. And last, we'll talk a little bit about active ingredients. We'll spend some time talking about uh, root disease products, uh, basically biocontrols, and we'll end up with mycorrhizal fungi, both of which, of course, help with root development in crops. But before I go into all that, we're going to talk about both production of uh, basically plugs and liners. So plugs, of course, would be from seed and liners would be from cuttings. Uh, before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about cuttings specifically. So when you receive your cuttings, uh, part of your success rate is how you handle them when they first come in the door. Um, so ideally, when, when you receive your cuttings, it's best to store them cool, and, but try to stick them within 24 hours of reception. So cool, it depends on the type of crop it is. For most crops, cool would be about 45 degrees Fahrenheit, although if you have certain tropicals or cold-sensitive plants, you might not want to go below 55 degrees Fahrenheit because that can cause some sensitivity issues. You want to minimize the drying out of your cuttings, so obviously the more the, the more moisture the cuttings lose, the less likely they are to survive or produce roots in, during the, uh, the rooting stage of the, of, of the process of producing the liners. And lastly, you want to determine, does that cutting require rooting hormone? Some do. You know, we know Osteosperm and Melantana definitely need uh, rooting hormone. Crops maybe such as Portulaca do not. Uh, but if you do use rooting hormone, keep in mind it does help produce more uniform, rapid rooting of your cuttings. Second thing I want to explain is the difference between young plants and mature plants. Similar to, to babies and adults, babies tend to need to be coddled more. They're more sensitive to their environment. They require a little bit more special care. It's the same thing with young plants and, and mature plants. Young plants are more, in sense, are more sensitive to their environmental conditions. So they require higher levels of humidity and moisture to get started. So basically for seeds to germinate, and for root initiation to occur in cuttings. Also, they also benefit from a narrower temperature range. They don't tolerate high temperatures and low temperatures. They like things more comfortable. And with light levels, believe it or not, a lot of them do not like excessive light. When they get older, the plants will tend to do better with that. That's especially true with cuttings, but they also don't like a lot of low light. So that also is a factor in that as well. So going into our actual presentation, let's talk a little bit about growing media. 
So growing media, specifically when it comes to seed germination situations and rooting of cuttings of fine growing media, so fine peat moss, fine perlite, or fine wood fiber, or core, whatever it may contain, uh, is kind of what you're looking for. Uh, the idea is you want to try to keep water contact with that seed and that cutting to help initiate basically for that seed to crack or for that, um, that cutting to actually start root initiation. If you have a lot of air gaps right around it, it will tend to restrict germination and also restrict uh, root initiation formation. Um, so you want to try to, in certain situations, avoid large pores, large gaps, big chunks in your growing media. In that case, in, in our product line, for instance, we have a Promix FPX biofungicide, which is basically a seed germination media. Now, in certain circumstances, uh, you will have cuttings, maybe they're a little bit longer, or perhaps maybe they're uh, a little bit more sensitive, such as ones that are real fleshy or ones that are hairy. Uh, they tend to be sensitive to low levels of oxygen. So in that particular case, you might want to use a media as a little bit more of a chunkier structure, uh, has a little bit coarser perlite in it, maybe a little bit chunkier peat, more wood fiber, whatever it may be. In that particular case, you might want to use a product that, uh, such as our product line, our Promix HP or Promix BX with the biofungicide mycorrhizae. That will give you better air porosity, uh, more air space within a growing media to help improve root development and growth. But in general, it depends on what the plant requirement is and basically your growing conditions. So if you keep the growing media really wet all the time, a coarse media may actually be more beneficial. Something that does dry a little bit more frequently, a, a finer mix would probably be better. So once you get that media and you start to go through the process of filling trays, you, of course you have to fluff it up first if it's a compressed bale, or if you're making your own using peat moss and other components, keep in mind that the time in the mixer is very critical. You do not want to keep it in the mixer too long. You want to try to minimize the mixing time because what will happen is the machinery will damage the components. So it will take the peat moss and fracture the actual peat fibers, or it'll take and smash up the perlite, and it can do the same thing with fracturing fibers on the uh, you know, wood fiber or other materials. In that particular case, if you create a lot of fines, that'll reduce your air porosity in your growing media, because your air spaces tend to be your larger voids that can very easily be filled by little tiny particles. Second thing you want to do, and there's two pictures on the bottom showing this, you want to try to avoid compaction. Uh, the problem is when you compact the growing media, the first things that give way would be your large pores, and those large pores are where your airspace is retained. So as an example, in that lower middle picture, you see the trays stacked on top of each other. Nesting inside each other is not good because the trays in the bottom will have almost no airspace in them, where the ones on top would have a lot more. That will create what we see in the second picture, the one all the way to the right, the lower right. We see basically tomato plants being grown. The one on the left, the one on the left, the root ball there did not receive any compaction. The one on the right did, and you can see there's a definite difference in the root production of the crop. Now, not only that, but also the container has an influence on the airspace and the growing media. So, in this example, we have three different container depths, same di diameter container, and also the same growing media. The difference is, of course, the depth. Now, we find that with the growing media being the same you have what we call a perched water table that forms the bottom of the root cell. Uh, that height of that perched water table does not change. It's basically about the same, uh, assuming watering, uh, watering is basically the same. So the taller the, the actual cell, we can see a lower percentage of the overall mix is saturated, and the more shallow it is, the higher percentage of the, of the growing media is saturated. So translating that into airspace, we have three examples here, three different sets of bar graphs showing three different types of media. The media is not relevant to this particular discussion, but notice there's a brown bar which represents the airspace in a one inch deep cell and the, the mustard colored bar which represents the airspace in a two inch cell. So we can see that the two inch cell, two inch deep that is, has anywhere from two to four times more airspace than the one inch cell or the one inch deep cell has. So again, just simply by the dynamics of the container can help improve air space. And of course, roots need both air and water to be able to produce uh, active growth. So air space is, is very critical to plant roots. Watering. 
I would be remiss to say that watering isn't important because it sure is. Watering dictates a lot of your root production in, in your growing media environment. So in general, when we look at the total production, so if we're talking about seed germination and produ production of plugs, or we're talking about liners, where we get root initiation into full liner production, the time when you're going to have the greatest amount of moisture in the growing media in your environment would be early on. And that's before germination occurs and before root initiation occurs. Oftentimes during that time, and I'm preaching to the choir, you're probably with many of you, but you're going to apply water usually in the form of mist to try to keep the humidity up, keep the moisture up in the growing media. And for seedlings, you want to keep that up until you actually get cracking or you get uh, actual emergence of the radical from that seed going down to the growing media. And depending on how long it takes for that seed to germinate, it could be anywhere from some of them grow or germinate in as little as two days, but some may take 10, 14 days on the back end. Cutting is the same thing. Once root initiation takes place, uh, you want to try to cut back on some of the watering. And root initiation somewhere between an average of about three to 10 days. Now, once germination has taken place or root initiation has taken place, you want to start backing off on the frequency of watering and the quantity of water. So if you're in a mist system, maybe you would stop, discontinue misting at this point or simply reduce its frequency. Or perhaps maybe in this point you replace it with overhead watering, whether it's from boom or hand watering or some other type of watering system. Now, once those roots develop further, so the roots start growing out, they start hitting the sides of the, of the cell wall, or they start growing down to the bottom when they start first appearing. Again, another step will reduce our watering even further. At this point, we, wanna, we don't want to be misting anymore. We want to be completely going with more of, a, uh, more of a dry down cycle between waterings. And that dry down cycle will then create mild water stress, which helps to actually favor root development in those plants. This is a picture showing uh, basically the amount of moisture that's seen in the growing media from a pictorial point of view. Uh, the way it's set up, Paul Fisher's done this down in uh, Florida, and I've seen this at other greenhouses across the United States, but essentially we take a look at this. Stage five would be when the media is saturated and there's basically loose water sitting on top of the growing media, if I can use that. Stage four, which is the next one, it's a little bit drier, so you don't have that freestanding water on the mix, but it's still fairly wet, almost saturated. Stage three, the next one, now we're starting to get some drying down. The mix isn't quite as wet, but it's still pretty moist. Stage two, now we're starting to see a little bit of uh, dry down of the media surface. And then stage one, basically your mix is, is dry, almost to the point where it needs to be watered. So where do we see these stages applied in, in production of liners and plugs? Well kind of see if you can see that reading there. So in the case of uh, the stage five, which would be the wettest one up in the top left-hand corner, that is reserved only for initial germination and root initiation stage. It is not designed to be used any further down the road. As a matter of fact, a lot of large growers don't even like the mix to even get that wet or stay that wet. They usually like to have a stage four, maybe a stage three. Well, stage four, I should say, really. Um, so again, stage five would only be for that germination. Once that seed cracks or once those root initials start to form, you would want to be backing it down from that point forward. Stage four would also be in that same consideration, again, for seed germination and for initial root development. Once those roots start to grow out, so you got the radical growing down from the seed into the growing media below, or you have the roots starting to emerge from the cuttings, you want to start to aim for a stage three. That is a point where get a little bit more water stress, the mix isn't quite as wet, and this is kind of the point of the dry down. So basically these are what, as far down, or the, the stages I should say, this is where the maximum dry down would occur. So stage three kind of looks like that. If we continue on, once those roots start to hit the outside of the uh, growing media, or I mean the outside of the root ball, and they start hitting the side walls of the plug, stage two is probably a good point. And then towards the end of the production cycle of the plugs or the liners, maybe you go down as far as stage one, although that might be pushing a little bit. But again, as the crop grows and we get past seed germination, past root initiation, we want to start drying down the crop a little bit more as we go towards the end of that crop cycle.
Now this is an interesting thing. Watering also affects the location of where the roots are found in the growing media. And I got a little tip here. This can help you determine how the watering is going on, whether you want to check on yourself or maybe check on someone else. So we have three scenarios here. Same growing media. This is a tomato crop grown with different three different watering techniques. The first one, the dry one all the way on the left-hand side, this is the point where the plants were allowed to wilt between waterings, actually in some cases a very hard wilt on the tomato plants, so the leaves are kind of hanging down. The middle one, the plants never went to a wilt stage, but they were kind of watered as needed, probably more an appropriate watering. And all the way over to the right, the mix never dried out between waterings, and it just stayed constantly wet. So if we take a look at where the roots are actually positioned in the growing media, uh, we see in the first one, the dry, we tend to notice that the bulk of the roots are found at the bottom of the cell. And the reason for that is when that seed germinated, because the mix is always staying so dry, the roots immediately went to the bottom of the growing media to find that perched water table so it can actually obtain some water to be able to grow normally. The one in the middle, we see the root development is basically more uniform from top to bottom. And if we go all the way over to the uh, right with the wet growing media, it's a little harder to see, but if you really look hard, you see that the bulk of the roots tend to be up at the top of the growing media. And again, that's because the the uh, bottom of that cell is so wet, there's no oxygen there or very little, so the roots don't want to grow down there because it's not an ideal condition. So you probably can see from very quickly, because these were all grown at the same amount of time, how pullable these particular plugs are. Obviously, the first ones are, are very pullable, the second ones are very pullable, but the third ones that are wet, you pull them out, half the growing media is going to stay behind that in the cell of that, of that uh, plant. So as we see, kind of summarizing, water affects the location of the root system. So if the mix is continuously dry, you tend to see your roots conjugate more at the bottom of the growing media or at the bottom of the cell. If you keep it continuously wet, we have roots that are found at the top of the growing media. Now, on the outside chance, or kind of in a rare chance, where you miss the growing media, but it's not really wet from top to bottom, maybe the bottom is still dry, but the top is, is, is moist to wet. In that case, you might see root development on top, but it would be very easy to see if you pull the plug out and the bottom is bone dry, the top is wet, of course the roots aren't going to go in that bone dry section. And what's interesting as far as the science is concerned, root elongation occurs where basically roots will basically grow towards a favorable water environment. So this picture on the lower right, you see kind of, it, it's basically a soil environment. You see kind of a lighter tan color. It's bone dry soil where it's a little darker color. That's where the moisture is. And you can see the roots will actually grow into the moist zone. Now, of course, if that soil was always saturated, your roots would tend to stay out of that saturation zone as much as possible. Now, this is kind of a little bit of a, an assumption point here, but obviously watering also affects crop quality. Not not that part, but this first point. One of the problems I see is is it's easy to put water on in the beginning. It's easy to keep things wet, and, and that's good because you need that for you know, root initiation and germination, as long as it's not way too wet. But as you go through the stages, you want to back down on the amount of water being applied and the frequency of application. The problem is sometimes it's a little hard to determine when it is, so sometimes it's easy to hold on to watering too frequently towards the end of that production cycle. So in some cases, although it's easy to overwater at any one of the stages, sometimes it tends to be problematic more towards mid to late part of those stages. And overwatering, just a quick definition, overwatering is not applying too much at one time. It's applying water too frequently so the mix doesn't dry out between waterings. So if your growing media is being overwatered or maybe just it's just really wet all the time or very high moisture, keep in mind that, that you'll see some, some symptoms of that. Number one, you get a lot of surface algae growth that occurs in a growing media surface. Number two, you tend to see an increase in root disease problems, especially your water molds like your Pythium and your Phytophthora. And your, root, or your top growth tends to be weak and kind of stretched and not, not really high quality. So again, that's how watering, or specifically overwatering, can impact your crop. But it also can impact your root architecture as well. So as we know, roots, in for the most part, should be white or maybe cream color. Uh, we know brown, the black, brown or black roots, that's not a good sign. That's root disease. 
Now, of course, there are some exceptions. There are some perennials and some, some trees and shrubs where the roots are naturally brown. They're not white, but we're not talking about those. So healthy roots should have root hairs in, in our uh, normal herbaceous production of plants in the greenhouse or in, in vegetables and even cannabis crops. So root hairs is seen in that upper picture. That's all the little hairs coming out. Uh, not every, every plant species produce a lot of root hairs. Some produce far fewer than others, so it's somewhat plant species dependent. But of course, the point of this is having those root hairs will increase the total absorptive area of the root system. It'll help bring in extra water and nutrients to the plants. So it's basically, it's maximizing its potential to capture nutrients and water. Now, if the media is always staying too wet, the roots don't have to search for water, it's always there. And we tend to get what we call water roots, they start to form. Basically, they're thin roots, they have very little branching, and they have no root hairs. Um, in this case, you don't really need the root hairs because the water is constantly there. The roots don't have to fight or function to get the water, it's just there. So in that lower right-hand picture, see those two blue arrows are pointing to roots that are actually on top of the growing media, if you're growing a crop and you're seeing roots on top of the growing media, that's probably a good sign that the growing media is really saturated, really wet all the time. I've seen some exceptions, like if there's something in the growing media. I've seen with impatience, if you have really high salts, sometimes the roots will not grow down into the growing media. But in general, usually that's a sign that things are probably being overwatered. Now, going away from watering will tie in with humidity. Of course, humidity is also moisture. But humidity, of course, should be highest during the uh, pre-germination and pre-root initiation stage in both plugs and liners. But humidity should not really be at 100% necessarily. It should be around 85 to 90. The problem is, and, and again, I probably can't do it as much justice as, as somebody who does this professionally, but there is a problem with keeping things too wet, even during pre-germination and pre-root initiation, you can rot off cuttings and seeds if conditions are too moist. So that's why it's important not to keep the humidity at 100%, but keep it a little bit lower, and also watch your watering. That's why, uh, going back to that, that, that five stages of watering, and stage five may not be appropriate. However, once you get roots forming, so you got that radical growing down from that seed, or you got the root initials popping out and the roots are starting to form, you want to start to reduce the overall humidity in that growing area to 70%, possibly, you know, maybe even a little bit less. That'll help to encourage faster drying of the growing media and also help to toughen up the plants a little bit. They, you know, lower humidity will have to, plants are going to have to, as they say, put on their big boy pants and toughen up and get out there and get used to the real world, so to speak. So it'll be a little bit less leggy. Keep in mind that high humidity has some problems associated with it. First of all, it slows the dry down rate of the growing media. It does it from two reasons. One, water doesn't evaporate from the growing media nearly as rapidly. And two, uh, plant, plant transpiration rate slows down. And what that means is the plants will basically absorb water through the roots from the growing media. It'll go through the roots, through the stems, out through the leaves, out through the stomates. That would be evapotranspiration. The problem is with high humidity, evapotranspiration stops. So basically the roots aren't drinking water from the growing media, which affects its dry down rate. But more importantly, with that water that comes up come nutrients. So if you're not getting water into the plant because of high humidity, you're not bringing up your nutrients. So it's not all that uncommon that calcium and boron deficiencies can occur in a crop when uh, humidity or basically when the humidity conditions are real high in your greenhouse. Also keep in mind if you cannot dry out your growing media and it stays wet too long, you tend to get, again, as I mentioned before, the algae growth start, starts to develop, which then attracts your shore flies because shore flies are favorite food is algae. And of course, you also get the potential of increasing root disease issues as well. And last, try, try to use horizontal airflow fans. I know most of you have those, so that's not a problem, but what that does is it helps to move that stagnant, humid air around and help to improve a little bit in the uh, evapotranspiration and water movement through the plant. Temperature, well, it's all relevant. So you can have temperature can be too high or it can be too cold. Either extreme will reduce seed germination rates and cutting survivability. Uh, ideally, you want your, and I want to stress this, not so much air temperature, but your growing media temperature, ideally 
should be between 72 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, depending on the crop, you know, some crops like to be grown cooler, some like to be grown warmer. That's true, but we're talking about getting that seed germinated. We're talking about getting those roots developed. That seems to be the optimum temperature for that situation. Now, keep in mind that, again, I said that's growing media temperature. It's not air temperature. In general, according to what we've seen in research, the growing media temperature tends to be roughly about 5 degrees cooler than air temperature. So if you're heating your greenhouse to 72, keep in mind your growing media temperature might be around 67. So it's a little on the cool side. Uh, part of the reason why is when you water, often the water that's going out of the end of the hose is usually uh, cold. It could be 55 degrees, it could be 50 degrees. But that on supposedly a 70 degree air temperature or a 70 degree media temperature, it's going to bring it down pretty quickly. That's why we encourage it's, it's a good idea to use bottom heat for rooting, cuttings, and germinating seed. Bottom heat will help keep that media temperature warmer, and will help to create a, a more a better environment for root development. Now, if you can keep the growing media temperatures warm, but you can then reduce the air temperature, that's okay because the roots don't see air temperature. If you do that, you can actually help produce a better quality plug or liner because it will help restrict a little bit on your top growth uh, so your root-to-shoot ratio may improve, meaning that your top growth is a little bit reduced, but your root growth is still going at, at, at optimal speed, so to speak, so you get better root development and your shoot development's a little bit held back, so you can end up with a better ratio. But be careful. If you grow below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, photosynthesis starts to drop off a little bit. So if there's not enough photosynthates being produced by the plant, that will affect its ability to be able to produce roots. Now, I'm not going to go into this real quickly, but keep in mind, this is really after, once you've got those liners and plugs produced. Obviously, some plants like to be growing cooler than others. Keep in mind that this is not applying to rooting or germinating seed. This is applying to growing on. So again, with this saying, Primula, its optimal growth is at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, Lantana, its optimal growth is around 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, growing on temperature is different, but when it comes to germinating seed or rooting cuttings, you want to be within that 72 to 75. I'm going to pass through this one because it's not relevant right now. Next thing I want to talk about is fertilization. So once those roots come out of that seed or once those roots come out of that cutting, the first thing they're looking for besides water is nutrients. Um, nutrients are very important because prior to that, all the nutrients that those roots are going to receive and that plant's going to receive is coming out of, uh, out of either that seed or out of that cutting itself. And there's only so many reserves and eventually be depleted. So research from uh, Florida, you know, with Paul Fisher and his group found that constant feeding at 50 to 75 parts per million nitrogen uh, helped to produce a healthier, um, healthier uh, liners and healthier plugs because you're giving them a source of fertilizer. As soon as those roots come out, there's nutrients for them to take up. Uh, not necessarily a news flash here, but at the same time, I think it's important to understand if those plant roots come out and they don't have nutrients to take up, they have water, but they don't have nutrients, um, what will ha what'll happen is there's no nutrients, the plant vigor would be overall reduced. So you don't get as much root and shoot growth. You, you tend to get more anemic growth. The plants are under stress, so they're more susceptible to root disease, and that's also a big factor in that. When it comes to fertilization, I also talk about potential acidity, potential basicity of the fertilizer. What that simply means is uh, when you're producing seedlings, you're producing liners, before those roots come on, before you have fertilizer being applied, uh, between the limestone and the alkalinity of the water, both of them are driving the pH or growing media up. So once you get into the fertilization mode, it's probably better to use something with potential acidity to help reduce the pH or at least keep it from going up any further versus potentially basic fertilizer, which will work in tandem with the water and the lime to continue to increase pH more. There's a lot more complicated explanation we won't go into there, but I'll just suffice it to say that. The other thing to look at with fertilization is phosphorus. You want to try to limit your phosphorus to about 20 parts per million phosphorus or 45 parts per million P2O5, which is represented by the middle number in your fertilizer bag. 
So just to give you an idea what our common fertilizers are applying today, if you're applying 100 parts per million nitrogen of one of the following three fertilizers, this will tell you how much pure P you're applying. Remember, our goal is to be at 20, roughly. It could be lower, but don't usually want to go much above 20. So 20, 10, 20. You apply that, you're applying about 22 parts per million P, which is good. 13, 2, 13, our next one, you're looking about 7 parts per million uh, pure P. So 7 is on the low side. You know, one of the symptoms of phosphorus deficiency is, is reduced growth rate, shorter plants. Not necessarily a problem as long as it's not showing necrosis symptoms. But the last thing I want to point out is the 94515, which I'm going to say it I don't think is a very good fertilizer to use. Uh, first of all, it's providing 220 parts per million P. Um, the plant will never utilize all that fertilizer. You're just kind of wasting your money applying that much phosphorus. And although they say that more phosphorus will induce root development, there's some truth to that. But when you get to those high levels, yeah, you, you, once you start getting above 30 ppms at the most, you know, pretty much the rest of it is pretty much wasted. So moving on, light. Um, basically light, you can have too little light. We all know that. So if you're up in the northern part of the U.S., Canada, you know that during the late fall and early spring, we just don't have enough light in this area of the world. Uh, so the problem with that is if you're trying to start seeds and cuttings that time of year, which is when we usually are, the problem is we have re reduced rates of photosynthesis because of lack of light. And we need those photosynthates produced through the process of photosynthesis, which are sugars and starches, all that. Those are used as building blocks to produce stems, leaves, and roots. So if we do not have enough photosynthates, we tend to find our roots tend to be thin and few in the plug. So the plug or the liner is not pullable very early. Uh, in that case, supplemental lighting is often used because we have to try to increase our amount of, uh, you know, our daylight integral, all those types of things. We want to try to improve that so that we at least have enough light during the day to maximize photosynthesis and also maximize root production on the crop. Now, there's also the possibility we can go the other way. We're going to have too much light or the light intensity is too concentrated or too strong. That's more of a problem down in the southern U.S. or maybe in the summer months up in the further northern part of the United States. Yes, the nice thing is you got maximum light. It does maximize your photosynthesis, but the problem is with all that sunlight, it tends to heat your leaves up, and if you start going above 90 degrees Fahrenheit will actually start to reduce photosynthesis because of the stress on the plant. And that will also reduce your photosynthates. Uh, sun can also very rapidly dry out cuttings. You don't want a lot of sunlight when you're rooting cuttings because, again, with all that heat, those leaves will tend to evaporate or more transpiration will take place with the water. You dry your cuttings out and they'll end up dying. So that's not a good thing. So it's a good idea to install shade cloth right above the crop to minimize the heat load that can come from exposure to the sun and also minimize some of the, uh, well, the heat effects and the dry down effects on that. It's more critical really for um, cuttings to keep your light levels a little bit lower in the high light intensity times of the year, but it really does apply both to seed germination also for cutting and for root development. Now I want to talk about active ingredients, and the first part I want to talk about is biocontrols to help with root disease. So they'd be incorporated into your growing media, whether you buy it pre-incorporated or you apply it yourself as a drench. Second, we'll talk a little bit about mycorrhizae, which usually those are pre-incorporated into your growing media. So let's talk about some basics about uh, using biocontrols for root disease. First of all, number one, they're preventative. They don't cure an existing disease problem because it takes time You once you apply a um, basically a biological uh, biocontrol to your growing media, you need time for that population to build up and grow. And as it grows, it usually grows on the root system of the plant because the plant feeds it. So it takes time to build up that high population to prevent, basically to put a preventative barrier around the root system of the plant. Uh, keep in mind that higher rates of a biocontrol does not necessarily mean you're going to get better biocontrol. Follow the recommended rates. Do not go above that because you're really not going to increase biocontrol levels. Once roots are colonized, um, the natural population will keep building based on the feeding of the root system. And also, I just want to back up to one point. 
keep in mind, bile controls are not a spray or drench, kill, and done. That's not how it works. These guys will need to be on the root system first before the pathogens come in. And remember, it's, it, it's there for disease suppression, not necessarily for disease prevention. Look at the range. If you're using a bile control, what does it control as far as pathogens? Some have wider ranges than others as far as organisms that targets. And remember, it's a tool in your toolbox. It's not, you're still probably going to occasionally have to use fungicide drenches. Uh, bio, or uh, I should say uh, environmental controls are also very helpful, you know, looking at your water and your temperature, that type of thing. We do tend that bio controls are not as effective in high disease pressure situations. So if you've had issues with lots of disease, it's probably a good idea to come in with, with a fungicide drench or maybe fungicide applications kind of knock down the population and then maybe bring a bio control in second. And, you know, look at temperature and, and, and moisture. Generally speaking, once it's incorporated into the growing environment, into the plant root zone, temperature and, and uh, moisture are not too much of an issue unless you grow real cold. So some of the other things, remember, we're dealing with living organisms, so they work differently in chemicals. They're preventative. We mentioned that earlier. Growing media temperature should really be above 50 degrees Fahrenheit to get the best activity out of your biocontrol. If it's below that, your reproduction rate of your bio your biocontrol tends to be much more slower. So if it's based on uh, population going around the root system and creating that barrier, you don't see as many uh, of those organisms reproducing as quickly, so it you don't set up the barrier quite as quickly. So warmer temperatures are good. Look at your pesticide compatibility. Some Fungicides are dangerous to some of your uh, biocontrol, so watch that. Storage requirements, again, how long will it last? Uh, it, it varies. In the growing media, it tends to last longer than it does in the actual, like let's say in the box or the bag that it would come in. And the reason for it is is it's sensitive to temperature changes. So in the growing media, it's with peat moss or wood fiber or bark, it tends to keep that uh, temperature fluctuation more minimal so you don't get that flash change in temperature, which often kills your biocontrol. Shelf life, a lot of these products, especially if you get them in their dormant stage, they'll last you know, a year, maybe two years. Um, and some products may require more than one application, so watch for that. So why will we use biocontrols? Simple. We want to reduce the incidence of root disease and thereby reduce plant loss. That's the whole reason for it. It will save you money, but up front, there's an added cost with putting the biofungicide in your growing media ahead of time, having it pre-incorporated, or applying it as a drench, however you, you will do that. Yes, there's an added cost up front, but if you reduce your fungicide drenches by, it's not uncommon to hear 50% reduction or sometimes even 75% reduction, the chemical fungicide drench cost generally will be as much or more than the biofungicide that's added to the growing media and, of course, it's nice not to have to apply as many fungicide drenches to help reduce your exposure to chemicals. Remember, it's an option in your IPM toolbox. It's not the end-all end. And one thing I really like about a lot of biocontrols, are mo a lot of them are, are natural organisms, so you can use them for organic growing, uh, which is great because it gives you an option to be able to control root disease without it having to be a, a chemical that I actually have to apply. And one last thing, uh, active ingredients or these, these natural organisms have little to no plant, human, or animal toxicities. They're natural, as I mentioned. They generally don't have a lot of issues or pathogen resistance. Um, they have little to no REI. Again, it can be used in some cases for organic growing. Look at the benefit of the fact that when you put a biocontrol in your growing media and the plant roots are sustaining that, that organism, that biocontrol activity will actually carry on to the retailer and the consumer down the road. And of course, consumers like the idea of less chemical fungicide applications. You can claim that with, with a biocontrol. So some pictures just showing, and we'll show some pictures showing top growth and root growth. So biocontrol, in this particular case, with uh, on the left-hand side, we have patients inoculated with rhizoctonia. Again, we see that the ones with the biocontrol, the plants are growing normally. They're not challenged by that because the root system is being protected. The ones without the protection, you can see the plants are much more behind or in some cases in the process of dying. On the right, we see that with pythium, uh, 
inoculation on geraniums. And we see that the ones without the biocontrol are more stunted, they're smaller, again, because they're, there's a challenge of the root system, they're nipping the roots and they can't acquire the nutrients and, and to produce better quality plants. Petunias, uh, basically you can see that with biocontrol there's a stimulation of root growth. Some do produce uh, auxins or other materials that will naturally stimulate root production. And we see on the left, we see a little bit more root development versus the ones on the right without the biocontrol. And for liner production, we see here with uh, Rex begonia, it's kind of obvious that with having that biocontrol, you see an increase in growth, and the plant overall is, uh, is doing pretty good, so compared to the control. And last, we want to talk about endomycorrhizal fungi, which is the more common branch of the mycorrhizae system that's used in, in basically in greenhouse crops. Uh, essentially, on the right-hand side, we have a picture. Uh, on the left-hand side, we see a root, which is kind of that wide structure, kind of tan color. And to the right of that, we see kind of a webbing that would be the hyphae of the mycorrhizae. And around little dots are the spores, which are the uh, resting stages of the, of the microorganism. So essentially how mycorrhizae work is this. You have your root system in your plant. The mycorrhizae spores will germinate or pieces of the mycorrhizae will start to grow. It'll go to the root, colonize the root. And then once the root system is colonized, it sets up structures within it, and then the roots, or then the hyphae will grow out from that point out into the surrounding growing media to bring in water nutrients where the plant roots are not present. That, in turn, increases total absorptive area of the root system of the plant. Colonization takes anywhere from about two to four weeks, depending on the crop and how close the roots are to the uh, actual mycorrhizae and helps to improve the acquisition of nutrients, specifically phosphorus, copper, manganese, zinc, also iron and nitrogen I've seen work with that, and also it uptakes, uh, it can help improve what, uh, water uptake as well. Now in return, that's how the plant benefits, but the mycorrhizae benefits from the plant because it's photosynthates, so the carbohydrates and starches the plant produces is used to feed the mycorrhizal fungi, and mycorrhizal fungi will also get some sort of protection uh, as a result of the colonization by the plant. So the plant will actually help protect it. Bottom line is this, wherever there's an environmental stress, whether it's nutritional, water, salts, uh, even in cases of heavy metals, where those levels are higher, mycorrhizal fungi will benefit the plant. And the greater the stress, the greater the benefit that's seen by the plant. So if you really want to wow your friends, uh, you know, grow things under very low nutrient environments, and we'll see mycorrhizae shine. You'll see bigger, better plants compared to those without. But if everything's fertilized properly, watered properly, there are still some visual differences, but not quite as dramatic. So again, the purpose of it delays the onset of nutrient deficiencies, and it does benefit the plant throughout its entire production cycle. You don't have to necessarily reapply it. A couple of pictures showing this. On the left-hand side of both pictures, so on the left we got lettuce, on the right we have cucumber. We see the ones with mycorrhizae, the plants are bigger after about four weeks. And notice the root ball on the bottom, you can see more root production. Taking a look at, I know this says tomato, but these are actually peppers. So on the left-hand side we see definitely more root production with mycorrhizae than the ones on the right without mycorrhizae. Last thing, root to shoot ratio. So again, you pull your plug, you pull your uh, liner. Uh, you don't like it because maybe the, the top growth is, is beautiful, but there's no roots on the plant. What can you do to prevent that from happening? Well, here's some pointers. Number one, temperature is a main, main factor. So we want to reduce temperature, not so much in a growing media, because again, we reduce temperature in a growing media, we reduce root growth rate as well. But if you want to try to improve that root to shoot ratio, there's what we call a negative diff. That was developed by Michigan State, or the concept was several years ago, but essentially what it is is your daytime temperature is cooler than your nighttime temperature. In practicality, it's a bit difficult, but they found that I think it was 60 or 70 percent of the effect can occur if you just take the first two hours in the morning when that sun comes up, drop the temperature in your greenhouse so it's cooler in the greenhouse than it was all night on average, you can achieve some uh, basically restriction of shoot growth. Um, you greatly reduce the internode stretching on the plants will be more compact, a lot firmer. 
but as long as you keep the uh, root zone temperature up on the on those plants, you won't see uh, any effects or negative impact on the growth rate of the root system of the plant. Second thing, we mentioned this about phosphorus before, but I'll go into this a little bit deeper now. Phosphorus level should be about 25% of the nitrogen level that you're putting on, just as a standard rule of thumb. Reason for that is, in the old days, we always thought, in, in plug production especially, we want to hit plants with high nitrate fertilizer, low ammoniacal nitrogen, because ammoniacal nitrogen causes stretching. Well, it turns out that's not actually true. Uh, Paul, um, Paul Nelson down at North Carolina State found out that your high ammoniacal nitrogen fertilizers also have high levels of phosphorus. Your low ammoniacal nitrogen fertilizers with, in converse, high nitrate levels tend to be very low in phosphorus. When the phosphorus level was adjusted and kept the same for both, they found very little difference in the stretching of the plants based on the nitrogen. So it's really the phosphorus that's the culprit there, not the amount of ammonium that's in the, in the fertilizer. And of course, we also look at high light. You know, you want to keep light levels high enough so it maximizes growth, but also higher light stresses the tops a little bit so you don't get as much stretching, so you get a little bit more of a toned plant. But again, uh, try to avoid 90 degree temperatures on the leaf surface because that affects, affects photosynthesis, reduces photosynthate, so it'll restrict the top growth a little bit, but it can also restrict root growth. Uh, second last one, water stress. Yes, as we mentioned, Try to, dry those, try to dry out the growing media. Introduce a little bit of water stress. It'll help the roots decide, hey, I gotta grow, look for, for water, but the top growth will tend to be held back because again, the water's not there inducing the stretching of the plants. And last point is lower humidity. Lower humidity is always good. It encourages faster dry down the media and plants do much better. And with that, I am done. <laughs> All right, thank you, Troy. Um, this is Robin again, and we are already getting some questions in. Uh, if you haven't asked a question yet, go ahead and submit it, and we'll get to as many as we can before the end of the hour. So, Troy, the first question we've gotten is, how long do biological controls, such as bacillus, uh, stay alive in the plug tray? Well, it, it depends on a number of things. So the the biological controls, especially like a bacillus, will stay alive throughout the entire crop production cycle. Uh, it goes through ebb and flows where it'll go up, it go down, depending on the amount of of uh, food that's there. So basically, you get a big flush of of growth of bacteria. It'll use up the food. It might cut back a little bit, but then food production goes back up because it's not all being utilized. So it, there's a little up and down in the cycle, but in general, you do have that root protection that's going on through the entire phase of that production cycle. All right. Okay, our next question is, are mycorrhizal fungi sensitive to a certain temperature range once they're applied, and uh, once they're applied and actively growing in the potting media? Those are certain optimum temperature range. Sure, yeah. So mycorrhizal fungi, we know from storage and growing media, do not like temperatures above 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's not all that unusual if you grow plants outside uh, in the summer on top of landscape fabric, like mums, for instance. It's not all that unusual that you may see some of those temperatures go up that high. It doesn't necessarily mean in that environment it'll kill it, but what it does mean is it'll reduce it, its uh, viability, at least on the side of the pot that hits, gets hit with the sun. On the lower end, we try to keep above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The problem is when you get colder temperatures, mycorrhizae and even your biocontrols, the reproduction rate slows way down, the growth rate slows way down, and you don't get quite the, you know, quite the impact from the biologicals if it's real cold. Okay. All right. Good to know. Uh, next question is also about mycorrhizae. Um, would Mycorrhizal fungi help even during issues with cation exchange, i.e. media locking up nutrients? Yes, uh, probably more in the organic situation, but what mycorrhizal fungi does is they have natural enzymes they put out in the growing media that helps to break down things. And the cation exchange sites, probably it helps a little bit, but I think it's more like if you have organic materials where nutrients are locked up, like if you're using organic fertilizers, would be a great example. Or if you just have organic components in your growing media, well, peat moss doesn't have a lot of nutrients and 
you know, wood fire has a little bit, maybe bark has a little bit, but those enzymes will help break some of that stuff down and make some of those nutrients more available. Again, on the cation exchange site, probably not quite as much, but if it's locked up in an organic situation, yes, it will help. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, we've got a number of questions coming in here. What was used for the control in the slide that compared ProMix biofungicide with the same, was it the same grow media without the biofungicide or was there something else in that control? Yeah, in all the pictures you know, that we we were showing, yes, it would be the same two mixes, one with either the biocontrol or the mycorrhizae, and the other one would be the same mix without. Okay, all right, just to clarify. Sure. Um, okay, um, another, does mycorrhizae concern, I'm sorry, does mycorrhizae consume any of the fertilizer that's applied to the potting media? That's a good question. You know, that is a good question. Um, from from the standpoint of what we see as far as, you know, I, I've seen growers that have grown crops on the lean side, really lean side, maybe a little too lean, and the plants without mycorrhizae are definitely more chlorotic than the ones with the mycorrhizae. Uh, does it consume some of the, the, the fertilizer? You know, I honestly don't know that answer, but I wouldn't be surprised it might take some of that. Uh, but I, I don't know the answer because the food it usually requires is the photosynthates produced by the the plant which gets leaked out through the roots that the mycorrhizae will take. Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, it is. It's something I've never really thought about before either. Yeah. Uh, does the ratio of ammoniacal nitrogen to nitrate nitrogen affect rooting vigor? I know you talked about the two. Um... Yeah. So as far as that's concerned, uh, there, there may be a little bit of impact. It's not very much uh, as far as which one. You know, the old the old standby used to be you want high nitrate because it, it looked more at top growth, again, saying it will keep your plants more stunted, or I should say more toned. It would be a better word. But it turns out it was the phosphorus that does that. When it comes to root production, I don't think the ratio makes – there's probably minor differences, yes, but probably not major differences. Usually, ammonium tends to create more of a lushness, at least in the leaves. So you might get a little bit larger leaves with higher ammonium levels than nitrate. That is true. But with root production, I'm not 100% sure if that actually makes a difference. I do not know that answer. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is We were getting a lot of questions about shelf life, which makes sense because these are biological products. Mm -hmm. uh, we store our unopened bags of soil in a back greenhouse. This means extreme heat in the summer and extreme cold in the winter. So how does this affect the biofungicide and mycorrhizae in the soils? Yeah, so the bottom line is it depends on what your temperature levels are. Uh, so essentially with storage, you know, what we usually find is 110 for a fun, fungi, 120 for a bacteria is kind of your maximum temperature. So if you store it inside the greenhouse, and the temperatures in that greenhouse can very easily be exceeding those temperatures, uh, that could be a bit problematic. However, to keep in mind that uh, peat-based mixes or core or bark, I mean, whatever organic material you're using, it's fine. It tends to buffer or it tends to insulate the internal temperature of that growing media. So even though it may rise up to 120 degrees inside that greenhouse, maybe 130, at night it basically becomes kind of the ambient air temperature for the most part. So the center of that media, once you get a half inch or an inch inside that outer layer, it doesn't see that extreme temperature because it sees more of the average between the day and night temperature. So generally it's not too problematic. Yes, on the outside edge, yes it is, but internally not quite as much. If you do store it, either open, maybe store it in a room like a, you know, like a, where your mixing machinery is, where there's no sunlight, or a shed or a barn or something like that might be a better storage place. Okay, all right. Um, our next question is about watering. Um, you said overwatering is more common towards the end of young plant production cycle. Uh, why is this the case? Well, and, and again, that, that's assuming some assumptions. So that's not the case for everybody. So I'm not trying to say that's always the case, but what I tend to find is, is for seed germination and for liner production, you know, in, in the early stages, you want things to stay wet to try to induce rooting. Once you start getting root production, you want to back down on the watering. 
it's kind of a real good science and a good art level to figure out how much do I back down as the stages keep going forward during that crop production cycle. So sometimes it's a little harder to, to figure that out, and I see a lot of times maybe the watering isn't stepped down fast enough, so by the time you get to the end of production cycle, watering tends to be a little too frequent, and uh, people tend to keep it a little bit wet sometimes. Not saying it's always the case, but you know, overwatering can quite frankly occur at any stage, but it just tends to be a little bit more of an issue towards that, that middle, maybe towards the end of the crop cycle. Not what everybody okay. can disagree with me, and that's fine. <laughs> okay, our next question is, is there a reduction in transplant stress using, bio, uh, using the biofungicides? Yes, so with transplant stress, so depending on the organism, uh, you can get biocontrol, uh, let's say, uh, protection within 48 hours, and some of them may be a week or two. But in general, it's, it's usually pretty rapid uh, development. So that's when the, the biocontrol is actually in the root system of the plant. So it helps to reduce stress, not so much from the standpoint of, of temperature stress, but more from pathogen stress. Uh, you know, a lot of times we, we forget that in the natural growing environment, it's not all that unusual. You might have low levels of pythium or low levels of fusarium that might be nipping at the roots a little bit, but not enough it causes concern. But it might be a little bit here or there because maybe the watering was a little bit frequent at one point or maybe you just hit a really cloudy, you know, cool period of time. With the biocontrol there, it, it really kind of prevents that from happening. Now, once that, you know, those pathogen levels build up even higher, then then the biocontrol becomes more suppressive than actually preventative. But outside of that, you know, as far as, you know, there's some enzymatic activity where you might get some dissolving of nutrients. We've seen some production of, of um, uh, some type of oxygen material, some phytohormones that can help uh, induce a little bit more root production on the plants. But we have seen it with some of the biocontrol, yes. Okay. All right, this next question, I mean, they're asking about Dracaenas, but the question may apply to a lot of different plants. Um, it's, I currently have Dracaena germinating, but the stages are wildly different within a single tray. Should I still be misting if some seeds have yet to germinate and some are entering stage two? Wow, yeah, <laughs> that's a tough <laughs> question. So mm -hmm. obviously, the the obvious answer is yeah. Um, you have different stages in there, and you're going to have different watering requirements in there. Um, so you have to ask yourself, what are you willing to sacrifice? Uh, are you willing to sacrifice lower germination, or are you willing to sacrifice possibility that the old, uh, the older plants might get overwatered? So it's kind of a tough one. Uh, when when we were talking about the stages before, you know, a stage four is great for seed germination. A stage five is probably you won't don't want to go there at this point. And again, that's the stage at which you water again. That that's where your, your dry down stage goes to, not what your watering stage comes from. Um, so you might want to avoid that that five. You might want to push it, see if you can do a three. It might a three might be the best of both worlds, but. Yeah, that, that's a tough one. And the other thing to keep in mind, too, and I think this is important, it may not be as difficult to water as you think because the plant cells, the, the cells that don't have a, a seed germinated probably are going to stay wetter anyway. So maybe that might actually be a bit of an advantage, at least for germination. Okay. Yeah, yeah that is a that is a tough one, trying to please both, that is a tough one. <laughs> both the stages, yeah. Um, our next question is about pansies. Um, any suggestions for creating a bulkier pansy plug and creating better transplant success for summer production? Well, <laughs> well, with pansies in summer, that that's kind of like uh, ice cubes in summer. They don't actually go together real well. But well, I meant ice cubes being melting. So as we know, pansies really do not like that heat. Um, yeah, that's that's a, a bit of a dynamic problem. It, it's difficult to grow a good pansy crop during the summer, and I get that you want to get a jump on the fall season, so you want to try to have something ready to go. The problem is, obviously, when, when we have watering going on, water it tends to be cooler than air temperature. It, it can cool the plant down. It can also cool down the root zone. So there's an example where your temperature is not 72 to 75. It might be in the 80s in your root zone. And for pansies, that's just getting too warm. Now, for seed germination, 
it's probably okay, but once we get past seed germination, we want to see a cooler temperature. So that's a tough one. Uh, again, more water will keep the media temperature down, which is actually beneficial to the pansies, but they're also more susceptible to um, the root disease like Flaviopsis. So it's kind of a delicate balance there. If there's any way to shade the crop, it would be beneficial because uh, it's probably getting more light than it needs. Um, you know, even a possibility of a light misting to keep the, the leaf temperature a little bit lower, but without having to saturate the growing media. These are some things that you might use, again, as long as root or foliar diseases don't become a problem. But again, it's a, it's a tough one. It's, it's tough producing roots. You know, again, trying to dry down the growing media will help produce roots. But again, it may compromise and keep the root zone temperatures too warm in the summer. So it's kind of a, that's a tough balance right there. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. Pansies in the summer are kind of a, um, uh, I don't even know what you want to say. <laughs> it's like an <laughs> antonym, I guess. They're opposites. But, yeah. Well, we, yeah, we, we are, <laughs> right. Uh, we need to wrap up the webinar. Unfortunately, we run out of time. So I want to thank everybody for um, attending, for sure. We had a great response. Um, thank you so much, Troy, for all the great information. And an on-demand version of this webinar will be available at the same link you used to watch it today. So you can go back and re-watch parts of it if you aren't sure about something. Um, you can also um, access it. You'll get a reminder tomorrow you'll, uh, with the link as well uh, in, case, so in case you misplaced it at this point. So thank you again for joining us today, and, and thank you to Premier Tech for making the webinar possible. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you.